Uh, wonderful to be with you all today. We're going to get straight into the conversation and really try to make it interactive. I wanted to just say, say a little bit more about myself and my work and have some time for Aisha to do the same. We are partnering together um, in the community in, in New York City and have some insights to share about the barriers that we've faced as a team working in the community and then want to hear from you about what you're experiencing, but not just what the barriers are, how you're overcoming them, because I think we all have so much to learn from each other. So um, just to put it into context for you, as Suzanne said, I'm the network director of Plant Powered Metro New York. We're a relatively new organization in the New York metro area, helping uh, to educate people about the power of nutrition, food as medicine. And we've really focused strongly on the role of plants in our, in our own health and healing. Why? Because plants are full of fiber uh, and they help regulate so many different parts of our bodies. Uh, and, we, and we actually de-emphasize animal protein, uh, which is a whole other conversation, but we don't need to actually go into some of the details. We wanna talk with you about how nutrition actually can be actualized within a community setting. Um, so for me, um, I was excited to start working with Aisha at JASA. Uh, she was an, an early participant in one of our programs. And Aisha, will you just share a little bit about what JASA is so people have a sense of, of uh, the work that you've been involved with? Sure. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Leanna said, my name is Aisha Parallon, and um, JASA is a private not-for-profit organization that was founded over 50 years ago and is one of the largest and I'd say lead agencies currently serving older adults in New York City. Um, we provide support, supportive services to over 40,000 older adults and their caregivers each year. Um, the services that we offer cover three main areas. One is senior housing, the other is home care, and the area that I actually am a part of is our services division. Um, I am the senior director of our senior centers. And so as Leanna mentioned, um, my experience with Plant Powered Metro New York was a personal one that I was able to um, bring into collaboration at JASA, particularly with our senior centers and some of our health services departments. Excellent, yes. So, and we're working together to roll out a series of programs using a, the Food for Life curriculum that was created by the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. And um, we just actually started our first cancer program last week, uh, which is uh, tremendously exciting with the support of the Live Strong Foundation. And what we're doing is really trying to overcome the barriers that many of these seniors have in accessing first of all, important nutrition information, and then to get to the heart of, well, you know, if you're gonna eat more plants, how can you do it in a sustainable way for your lifestyle, for your budget? Um, how can you learn the skills that will allow you to feel comfortable preparing meals for yourself and, and choosing meals that are, let's say, the, the lesser of any evil that you find out, out in the world at a restaurant or that you take in. Um, and what, we are, what we're trying to do that I think is really key to this discussion is to overcome one of the big barriers that I, I'm sure many of you have, have come across and certainly Josh articulated it well, uh, which is that evidence-based nutrition really needs to be a part of the cancer narrative at all. Um, I'm, I would be curious to see if you want to sort of, uh, you know, put a sum up or something, how many of you, uh, those of you who are cancer survivors yourself who have gone through cancer treatment are currently doing that have actually had nutrition brought into your discussion. Um, I'd love to maybe just pop it into the chat box quickly. Uh, you know, yes, I've had it. No, I haven't. Or, you know, has it been a little bit there? We're gonna start calling on you if you don't. <laughs> you should watch out. I can unmute you. I have the power. Right. Cindy says you got it from a naturopath, so not from your clinical team, your cancer care team. Anybody um, else? Mm -hmm. I work for uh, the Heimerdinger Foundation in Nashville, Tennessee, and we provide meals to people going through cancer treatment. And one of our questions that we ask our clients is if their um, oncologist gave them any information about um, a healthier diet, you know, that sort of thing. And we have found that 60%, uh, excuse me, 80% of doctors do not have a conversation with their, with their patients about um, a plant-based diet or um, improving their diet and eating whole foods and that sort of thing, so. 
Absolutely. That's and we're seeing also in the chat box, you know, a lot of people saying they haven't, it, that 80% number is very similar in the survey that we did of the participants in the cancer program we're running right now with, uh, with JASA. Uh, 10 out of the 15 people, so 66%, two thirds are saying they had no information from their doctors about nutrition. And um, those who did get it are sometimes getting it about very specific needs that they have. Maybe they have acid reflux and maybe there, you know, there are specific impacts from certain drugs that are, are leading to um, things that might be helped along with nutrition, but it's not a holistic look at nutrition. And that's really a big, a big barrier that I think we have the power to overcome um, with, a, with a lot of work. Uh, so really it's, it's not part of oncology training, generally speaking, to be studying nutrition. Um, and we really wanna help make, it, make a case for this. So you know, making that case for food as medicine is key. And, and if you look at the American Institute for Cancer Research website, um, all of the cancer fighting foods uh, are fruits and vegetables, literally all of them. And we all know high fiber, um, you know, the, the the aspects of whole grains and legumes also that, um, you know, help to uh, balance the system are really critical. So because tr nutrition is not a part of the treatment protocol, it really seems like a lightweight, like, oh, it's nice to have good nutrition, or, you know, it's not really a significant player alongside the medical things that you can do, the, the chem chemicals and the radiation. So um, I'd love to hear more from you about, um, specific times that you have uh, overcome this, this specific education barrier? What have you done in your communities? Oh, hi, this is Xu. Um, um, I work for the um, UHC um, Norris Cancer Center, um, the AYA program for adolescent and young adult with cancers. Uh, we have been done uh, some um, educational outreach in terms of nutrition. So we have three uh, dietitians from our cancer center. Uh, we've been doing, you know, um, education on um, antioxidant and also on the uh, nutrition one to one, 101 and also on, you know, eating during COVID. So we've done the series and also we're planning to do a sort of Spanish version, you know, since we serve a very diverse population in our area. Um, the, the challenges we have is um, we, we, our dietitians were teaching through, you know, PowerPoints and then, you know, we're having interaction conversations. Um, I think it's, um, uh, we don't have a huge attendance for some reason, um, but also we captured it. So we are putting on YouTube so we can also reach out more people. So we, we feel it's a very important topic and also, uh, you know, our patients who are uh, already in our hospital, the inpatient population, we do have dietitians so, uh, serving them individual needs, you know. Um, Although sometimes we also hear uh, complaints, especially from younger um, uh, age groups that we serve. Uh, like uh, I think the the menu items they feel are not fitting their appetite, and um, so it, even though they're healthy, but somehow you know they uh, crave for other types of food. And then during COVID, it was really hard to bring any outside food for the safety reasons. So that bring. Uh, Quite a lot of you know um, frustrations, and then also in terms of you know educating, um, like how to provide a uh, very robust curriculum for you know cancer patients and also for you know uh, young adults with cancer. So I think those are the two things uh, we're trying to find some you know solutions. And That's suggestions. great. It's wonderful that you're doing this through a clinical setting. First of all, it's really not common for that to happen. I think and. Um, and the, the issue again with that you brought up about, you know, people not necessarily liking the food. Um, I think in all of this, it, it expresses another barrier that, that we all need to overcome, which is how do we make sure that when we teach about proper nutrition, that it speaks to people in their cultural and, and culinary language. Um, one of the things that we're trying to do with JASA specifically is to think about who these older adults are, what kinds of foods are they already eating? And how can we make simple adaptations to that that are moving them in a healthy direction? So if you're on a fixed income and you only have access to these kinds of foods, what else might be accessible on a budget? Getting the canned beans or the dry, actually the dry beans are less expensive than the canned beans, right? Getting conventional produce, even though we know organic produce can be better for cancer outcomes, um, eating more produce is better than not eating it at all. So 
um, we focus on on what you have available to you in your neighborhood. And certainly now in the age of COVID, where you know so much more food is accessible to people just by virtue of the delivery systems being improved, even in New York City, um, we're seeing a lot more produce, um, you know, delivery systems coming into play, which is wonderful. But the culinary, the to speaking to people in their own cultural language about food is key. Um, I'll mention also we did a nutrition program with the Afro-Caribbean community in, in Brooklyn and created entire meal planning resources and recipes that really fit their cultural profile. And so that, that's got to be a piece of this. Uh, Dr. Bennett, your hand is up. Yes. Good afternoon. Um, I have, um, I'm a 25 year breast cancer survivor and I learned about eating healthy after my diagnosis from my naturopath. So in the curriculum that I have, I have 11 different support groups in the greater Houston area. And one of the sessions is, do I eat to live or do I live to eat? And in that session, we talk about nutrition as well as uh, we have them to fill out a survey and to look at what they're eating. We're fighting a lot in the African-American community, even though our, our um, support groups are multi-ethnic, but in the African-American community, we have to, a barrier is to, when persons do, um, do not eat healthy simply because it's been the tradition. So if my mother ate, my mother ate, um, let's say, fried pork chops, okay, and she cooked them. Well, I don't do that anymore. I stopped that years ago. And it, to try to get people to change who don't have a sense of why is this important to me is critical. We also have a breast health education session called Pampering with the Twist, Live, Learn, Laugh, and uh, Live, live love laugh and learn and in that it's, it's, we, we did it this year virtual normally we do it face to face in the virtual aspect we had um two ladies talk about nutrition but only do they also did live demonstrations of eating healthy that group that session the breast health education was targeting african-american women and to hear the comments about gee i didn't realize i could do this cook this way and still eat healthy were, were comments that we got from the attendees. We had 55 attendees. So we do all that we can, but again, we fight tradition. We also have Latino ladies who, well, my mother made uh, tamales during Christmas. And you know, I'm gonna make tamales, I'm not gonna stop. And they use the beef and the chicken, et cetera, and so on. But again, we talk about, you know, well, how do you change that? How do you make that um, more useful for your body? And then the third thing is that we talk about grow on your own. Um, I haven't had a garden in, let's say, 40 years. My daughter is, almost, is 38, and I just started a garden. Uh, she encouraged me, let's do a garden, and that helped because she's a younger generation, and having a garden in the, at the house has just been, you know, refreshing because I do eat a lot of uh, healthy, uh, you know, fruits, fresh fruits and vegetables, particularly organic, when possible. Exactly. Yeah. And I think, you know, growing your own food is always a way to reconnect you. And, and I think it makes us more spiritually aware of where this food is coming from and why it's so, so nourishing on, on so many levels. I'm um, going back to what you said, though, about the importance of the culinary demonstration. Absolutely. That's like a big, big piece of our work um, where we, uh, we used to get in, into a room together and teach people the skills right there, but now we've done a lot of virtual demos. I also wanted to share related to what you said about, uh, you know, people's habits and their culinary preferences and how it's tough to change. Um, uh, on this, uh, in the link that I'm sharing in the chat box, you'll see we created a Caribbean and a soul food um, resource for the folks in our programs. And, and that was to say, look, if you're familiar with these flavors and, and ideas, like here, try them with in this way or in that way. Um, and we're trying to do that for other cultures as well, because we want to show them, look, you don't have to fry it. You can use a plant food in lieu of an animal food. You can get rid of the added sugar and, and swap in the natural uh, sugars that you might find in dates or that you might find in other fruits. Um, and just helping them with all those healthy swaps and then letting them taste it for themselves is key. Uh, I, I, would, I, I have a lot more that I can share about that, but I would love to hear if other people have experiences specifically addressing the cultural challenges of people who you know, have been eating certain ways for a long time. And how, do you, how have you overcome uh, some of those barriers? I think we all fall into that category at some point, right? Josh, did you want to? 
I, say, I don't see the raise hand option, but I wanted to say something. Uh, as far as like the uh, transition of like where, where someone's starting and how they're transitioning, uh, I find that it's super common that people fry their food in canola oil, which is probably the most toxic oil you could use for on a cellular level. So something as simple as like, oh, you're using canola oil. Why don't you try coconut oil? Why don't you try avocado oil? Like that's an easy step that's not going to take away that meal. Um, and I, I seem to be a little biased on like the plant versus, you know, uh, meat causing cancer or helping health and things like that. But regardless, a simple transition is just about generating momentum. So if someone's like, oh, I'm not going to give up fried whatever. Okay, cool. Well, one, let's audit. What's the oil? We know canola oil is toxic. There's so much evidence with that. So why not find a different oil? Even if it's olive oil, it's got a lower smoke point, but it's still better. Um, and then from there, what are you using to bread the meat that you're cooking with or the vegetables you're cooking with? Because we know there's tons of different options than just using processed flour. So those are just some things that come to mind for me because it's about generating momentum, not just saying, I'm going to take all this away from you and you're going to be healthier because that's not going to emotionally resonate with someone. They're going to be fearful. That information is going to come in one year and out the other. And I say that from my own experience as well as working with clients. Let's just start with some shifts. Let's just change the source. And then over time, we'll see what comes up from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, part of it, Josh, is just knowing what's in your food to begin with. Why are you making the food the way you're making it? We are so creatures of habit. And if we stop and just start thinking about the food, that's like a huge piece of it. And then going to the swaps and then figuring out, oh, if I make it with this ingredient versus that ingredient, I like it more. Um, or I like this food cold and I like this food warm. Like there's so many different um, aspects of how we eat and, and how we approach the, uh, the eating process itself that I think we can bring all those things to people's attention. Um, I will say there's one thing that I have learned in, in our work that I think um, is, you know, there are different ways of approaching it. There's, there's one stream of thought that is to say, look, let's try to incrementally make change and help you feel comfortable going that path. And a lot of people want that approach. They want to do it gently. And there are other people, and I, I have found that people who are um, particularly overwhelmed by their disease, whether it's cancer or something else, who want to say, look, I need to make a change and I'm willing to do whatever I can right now to just overhaul it. And we are finding, and I think, you know, we're, we're sort of building on some of this beautiful research that's been done in the country, um, that if you offer people a full picture of what a healthy diet is and give them the support to go fully in that direction rather than making incremental change, that they will find such benefit, benefit from it so quickly that, um, that they'll want to stay the path. And so we, we use this model for our Jumpstart programs. And maybe Aisha, I'd love to bring your voice back in here. Um, what it feels like to go through a Jumpstart where you, for two or three weeks, you try on for size, a completely different uh, nutrition lifestyle, and then where it leaves you at the end um, and how you feel about it. Aisha, do you want to comment on, on that approach? And then we can sort of open it up to everybody to talk about, well, moderation or, or all in. Sure. So just my personal experience, I've actually had the opportunity to participate in two of the program's jump starts. Um, just thinking about that kind of all jumping all in or not for myself, I'm the type of person that found benefit in letting go of my traditional way of doing things to try something new along with the education. And I'd like to tie that in also with the seniors at JASA. Um, part of getting people to buy into making any transition to the way that they eat um, and changing anything culturally is that educational piece because if they don't see the benefit to their health, there's no purpose in doing it. Sometimes people are willing to forego tradition for their health. I just had to say that um, because that was my own personal experience. Having um, a mentor who was in the lifestyle and was reachable just about 24 seven to give me tips and advice on how to switch certain things or how to prepare things differently was immensely helpful. Um, in the time that I was participating in the jump starts both times, um, I was able to see a reduction in my blood pressure, which my doctors were very happy with. Um, 
And I've since been able to maintain the lifestyle because I remain connected um, to Plant Power Metro New York. Um, it helps now that JASA and Plant Power Metro New York are also um, partnering. I hope I didn't deviate too much from what you were asking, Liliana. No, totally. And I think, you know, we, we've heard this also. We had a focus group with a bunch of, of women who did our, our most recent jumpstart. And, you know, to hear that they've lost 30 pounds within a short window, six weeks, to hear that their blood pressure has normalized, to hear and to feel what, what it feels like to have your mood and your energy levels return. When people understand the power of food to that extent, that's the motivating force for lifelong change. And to get them to that stage of readiness, I think is the biggest barrier, which is just, um, you know, just, it's the knowledge and it's the belief in the knowledge, right? You can have the idea, you can have the information, but if you don't believe in it, it's hard to act on it. And then it's the skill building and the cultural um, support that goes into it. So I know we've got a lot of thoughts now, so I'm gonna stop talking. Elizabeth, did you wanna say something? Yeah, I just wanna make a comment. This is such great information and I'm going to try to make this the time where I take more control. I feel that conventional medicine does not stress this enough. And I know that we've already said that and I'm tired of it. I go to my oncologist and they tell me, you know, I'm in pain because I'm taking, I have this sitting on my table right now because I don't want to take it <laughs> because when I take it, it causes me pain. And they say, well, go talk to the therapist. I said, I don't need a therapist. <laughs> I need help because this is healing me, but hurting me at the same time. So don't tell me that it's making me better. And I asked them about nutrition and I asked them about, you know, and part of it's my control. So I'm gonna to try to take control. And that's why I'm so happy for the Live Strong program to offer these things because I have to take more control because it's about what that gentleman said earlier. There's, I'm sorry, I'm gonna just say it. There's a lot of money in cancer. I'm gonna just say it. Okay, I'm a breast cancer survivor and I'm blessed to have gotten the treatment that I've gotten, but it's like what everybody's saying. I want to focus now on, I don't think I, I understand the power of food. I know it's there, but um, I'm sorry if I'm getting emotional. Elizabeth, it's, it's okay. And I mean, you're giving me chills just thinking about how tough this totally is with, um, the idea is that we have to move forward with things that harm us, that feel, that feel harmful in our they body. They are. They're right? telling me they're healing me, but they're not really healing me to get that extra bit of percentage coverage that I'm going to get better. But you know what? What's it really doing? I'm waking up every day feeling old mm. and right. painful, I'm... right? So I know, I know part of it is I have to exercise where I get that, but I don't think I understand. And I'm, and I'm grateful for this seminar because I feel like I have to understand, like you said, food is medicine. It's so hard to dig through it and get there. So I just wanted to give my, my five cents. <laughs> thank you, thank you. And, you. and really you've brought forward how traumatic the experience is. I, I'm, I, I'm not a cancer survivor myself, but my mother is, and I was a, a teenager when I was driving her to her radiation and chemotherapy and remember how, how deep each of those moments were for, for her and, and, and for our whole, whole family. And I just, I, I feel it. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, so go, I think then, if, you know, to build on what Elizabeth is bringing forward, um, no, the knowledge of food as medicine is, is, is still, you know, it's considered controversial, it's considered um, fringe, right? If I could count a number of times that people said, Oh yeah, well, you know, chemotherapy, radiation, food, like it just, it just doesn't happen. Um, and we have to be a part of this wave of change, all of us. Uh, I would love to hear others who have, I don't know if you have similar experiences or other experiences. Again, you know, we want to come to a place of solutions, overcoming some of these barriers. Um, what else have you tried? Well, uh, I'm the director of the Small Cancer Resource Center in Ells Ellsworth, Maine, rural Maine, and that's not connected with a treatment center, although we, uh, we're connected, but not formally. We, we, we reach out and talk, and they make referrals to us. And, and uh, we, we do have different programs about nutrition. It's not as coordinated as maybe it could be. Actually, we, we have a, 
developed a program through a, a woman who was a master of public health candidate at a, a university in Maine. She, she took the Five to Thrive program of the American Institute for Cancer Research and, and adapted it. So it, we presented it a few times. And it's, again, it's this challenge of, uh, uh, if you have a group of 10 people coming to a class, they might have different views on nutrition. There are different places. So how do you challenge? How do you present a program that maybe works for all of them? You know, and uh, and uh, so it's we do it. I, I think obviously, if the oncologists were really on board and 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 share nutrition information, it would make. A, a, I think that's a major first step. Uh, the other thing I, I've got to uh, bring up. My my wife was a actually a cook at a small school in our area, and her major gripe was how the the USDA program that you know that the foods that they were being sent to be the kids in in the in their school were was just horrible, you know, and and it was uh, it was uh, meat you know salty all all this stuff and it was. And the schools are using it because they're subsidized for it. So this is beyond this talk, maybe. But if you if you start feeding our you know students more healthily in, in elementary school and high school, and got away from the fact that you know we're we're getting free food and therefore it's free food that's not really good for you. And so it you know it it's, it gets back to starting even earlier than when you've been diagnosed with cancer. So that may be. You could avoid that. Exactly. And I, I, I would love to ask a quick question if I can. I would love to hear from, because um, kind of what I've heard over and over, I'm sorry, this is the best part of my job is getting to listen and, and hear from, from all of you um, who are experts in various ways. It seems that it's um, one of the barriers, the barrier kind of begins at the oncologist's office, or kind of begins right there. And so I would love to hear from, from some of you about what do you What's a, what is that barrier? Is it knowledge? Is it just that they don't have time? Is it that, what, what do you think that barrier is? So we can begin in this next session, because you're going to get another invitation later, um, to solve it. But I, I, I would really love to learn what you feel like the barrier is there. What's causing that? I think that? it's a lot of it is knowledge on oncologist's part. I think one of the things that I read, reading about the American Cancer Institute of Cancer Research, they're doing research to get evidence based, to get evidence on the fact that plant based diets are, are good. So you hear a lot of times, and maybe an oncologist says, we don't have, there's no evidence for, for you eating this way or something like that, or that's what they say. So, uh, you know, I, I think that's a large barrier. In theory, you're hoping that maybe the, the people going, the new oncologists are getting different information on nutrition and you know many of the oncologists 30 years ago in their defense you know there was no even consideration of nutrition having a factor in cancer treatment hopefully this new generation of oncologists are maybe being trained in in that Nan? um uh, as a cancer patient and a person that's working in the industry what i've heard is that, um, or what I understand is that the oncologists are focusing on the disease and it's actually the nurse practitioners who are the ones that are giving out the information. And that's where we get most of our referrals from. And we work very closely with those oncologists, nurse practitioners, because they're the ones that are getting, that are um, getting to know that patient one-on-one -on -one and hearing what their needs are nutritionally. And also we serve not only the clients, but we serve their families. And so educating kids through actually trying the food and their spouses and all that stuff, that is the best way that we have found um, in supporting our clients is through, um, through you know, hands-on eating the food, <laughs> you know, that's the best way. But the nurse practitioners is where we have got our, um, and social workers, where we've kind of got our foothold and with that, yeah, that's great, Nan. Elizabeth. Thanks. Um, I guess the hand disappears eventually. Um, but so, um, hi everyone. I'm I 
I'm both a cancer survivor and um, breast cancer three years ago. And then I also work for an organization called Family Reach and we help with the financial burden of cancer. And um, while education I think is definitely incredibly important and needs to be there upfront, I do think another barrier to healthy food is the cost. I mean, thinking about different oils and also drawing back on just half my family being Puerto Rican. I've gotten to know that cuisine quite well and it's such an economical cuisine. <laughs> um, and so many of the choices that are made, I think are also just based on the cost of various foods and, um, you know, using oils as an example, since that came up earlier, it's like that, you know, also without that education piece, people don't understand the toxicity of canola oil, but it is also one of the cheapest oils that's available. Um, and I think that the way that we have been taught to think about value, it's, you know, putting, spending as little as possible and getting as much back, but we're not educated on, you know, the true cost of the dollars that we save. Um, so, uh, one of the things that Family Reach has done, we've established some new partnerships to be delivering um, prepared meals through meal delivery companies. Uh, we've been working with Freshly and Splendid Spoon, and while that's really just a pilot, and I feel like, you know, I already have sustainability questions in mind as far as how we'll keep this going or how we can improve it. Um, that's one of our approaches right now is to support the families we serve with um, prepared meals that, that do have nutrition in mind. So. That's great. I was going to say in response that, you know, the way that I think about American food and the economical value of it is sort of that we have a calorie rich and yet a nutrient poor way of eating. And but most people don't know that if they're not, <laughs> they may be eating excessive calories, but not getting enough nutrition. Uh, and so helping to reframe, well, how can you maximize calories and satiety while also getting all the proper nutrients that you need is a piece of the educational process, but it doesn't solve all these structural issues, subsidies and the things that we know cause the problem. But, but I personally think that once you see a new nutritional paradigm, you are able to understand um, better, uh, you, you're, that you're then able to see where food is accessible to you in your community. You look differently at the shelves that are in your bodega or that are in your grocery store. Um, and, and many there are more options than I think many people are even aware of. Um, uh, one of the closing thought just on oncologists, um, and this also came up in the chat box, uh, Judy said oncologists concentrate on the, the, the pharmaceuticals and, and really aren't uh, seeing uh, other treatments. I think that's true. And we have an oncologist on our medical advisory board who is a one, she's studying multiple myeloma and nutrition and lifestyle factors. She's at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And, um, and she tells me all the time, you know, she goes to the, the oncology conferences and there's just no understanding of nutrition, no talk about it in the discussions and the food that they serve is uh, just totally stuff that you would never eat. And I feel like um, there's definitely work that we can do and Susan, we can follow up about it another time. Um, you know, talking about this because the standard of care is such that uh, it, it follows, uh, you know, a, a medicinal intervention path. Um, Dr. Bennett, you have something else to share? Yes. Um, most, all of our support groups except two out of the 11 are at medical facilities. And those medical facilities, as you said, the oncologist and or the surgeon do not discuss nutrition because many of those, in fact, all of them have what's called a um, oncology dietitian. However, it makes me wonder, do they know how to tell patients to access that person? That's why I make sure that when our, our facilitators get to the session on healthy eating, that they contact that medical, um, the oncology dietitian, so that she can um, discuss with the, with the group. Uh, we're doing everything virtual now, but to discuss with the group, you know, what's important in terms of nutrition after you've had cancer. We try to especially capture the newly diagnosed. The nurse navigators at those facilities do not talk about, you know, health and nutrition. They talk about standard of care, and that's about it, which is a shame because. I had to teach myself as well as learn from my naturopath what it is and what does it mean to uh, eat healthy after a diagnosis. And that's why when we did our breast health education session that we included, you know, healthy eating and growing your own vegetables because many people you know, run through McDonald's because what? It's the cheapest. What do the commercials say? You get so many for a dollar or two dollars or whatever it is. I don't even listen to it. Um, and the people who we serve a lot of them, that's what they do because that's what they can afford. That's what's quick. 
and many of them are young mothers and it makes it easy for them. So therefore, um, I think that, and I do breast cancer, I'm on the committee, uh, I'm on the panel for breast cancer research through the Department of Defense. All the research I see coming through and coming through the Department of Defense in terms of, you know, getting rid of breast cancer um, is what we're looking for in terms of nutrition. Everything is the next chemical, the next drug, the next therapy, so, uh, which is, is sad. So anyway, uh, I just wanted to share that two, two cents that uh, we're at some major places here in Houston, and um, I just don't expect them to do it because that's why we have to do it. Yeah. Thank you. Josh? On that note, and what Elizabeth straight up said is what I believe, like the reason I get involved with politics today is because when I was asking these questions, why is this not being said? Why is this not being taught? It comes back to money, unfortunately. And I was invited to the Biden Cancer Summit in 2018 or 19, whatever it was. And I had so much resistance from bringing up nutritional proactive steps and, and or treatment options with standard of care. But the only interest was conversations about venture capitalists investing into pharmaceuticals and using that with what is already the standard of care and how much money could be made. And then you combine that with society that can get anything they want from this thing. If they have enough money, it can be done for them looking at the quick fix. And the reality is many people as human beings are wired to not want to do the work to get to where they want to go. Oops, am I still here? Yes, you're here. Okay, my computer is freaking out, so I can't see anything. Um, but when I was in that position, watching all that happen, and then asking these questions about why this, why that, it comes back to money. And then you add in the fact that, you know, the lobbyists adding, you know, resistance to this, there's the sugar industry, the big uh, food industry, wanting to keep their profits and their shareholders happy. Healthy people don't make money. And that's the sad truth of American society. And then you add in the fact that the collegiate level of education is a one of diagnosis and treatment based on medication and surgery. And I know this not from my own experience, of course, but from doctors that have gone through these things that become those controversial, wacky doctors talking about food as medicine is because they're not taught this. They're taught maybe a little basic chemistry of food biology, and then they're taught, here's how to diagnose, here's how to treat with a medication or surgery. And what do they call it? It's like, uh, they call it like a uh, side paper prescription medication. I forget what the term is, but it's like, here's a diagnosis. Here's a list of options with medication and surgery. This doesn't work. It's an algorithm. We'll, we'll try this. Oh, this one caused you to be sick or to be tired. We'll add this in. And all that's doing is breaking down your system more. And if your body can rejuvenate, then cool, you survived. And then they cut that time frame for survivorship at a ridiculous rate. And then it just comes back to money. So that's, I think the biggest challenge is, yeah, education. But then yeah. you have things like wheat, corn, and soy, which are toxic to human beings because they're just processed food. Yeah, they're plant-based, but they're not even really food anymore. And that generates money. And then those companies, those industries are fueling this problem more. So it's going to take people educating themselves and taking those hard decisions with their earned dollars to vote for what they want to be true. And then even with that, you have the big sugar industries that are just combating everything. And so I think what it comes down to is these conversations and people taking, you know, uh, control of their life and choosing, you know, like this broccoli may be $5, that soda is 99 cents for a two liter. That was my reality. So I drank the two liter of soda every day because it was cheaper than water, for example. But it's just about getting real with what do you want? Let's invest in that. Because I, I, I've talked with so many people that are okay buying $5 coffee every day, but a carton of, you know, free range eggs is $5. Well, that's too expensive. And it just comes down to priorities. So um, yeah. That's my two cents on this problem. No, thank you, Josh. And it, what you bring up is so great because like, obviously following the money is revealing. It's difficult. We get into the space where people think that we're sort of like conspiracy theorists if, if we bring up stuff that's anti, but at the same time, if you follow the evidence, the evidence is clear. And it's just so easy, I think, to fall into this paradigm of, think, of being, being angry at the systems that are making us sick. And I think what I've felt so inspired by in this whole food discussion is that I can take power of myself despite whatever else is going on. I'm going to do my best. I'm going to help as many other people do the same thing. We're going to build a movement. We're going to build a wave. It's going to overtake the conversation, hopefully. And then, and then change comes. And to get to that space, though, you have to overcome this sense of hopelessness that I think you know, it just typifies the experience of disease in America that we, we feel like we have to do 
what is prescribed to us. And, and by, by prescribed, I don't want to say only from medical care, but also societally and the, the culture that we live in and in our toxic food culture. Um, so I think this is where like, I want to say, hey, let's have hope. Hey, let's, let's take that anger and turn it into action. And let's not live in this space where we, we feel like we, can, we, we have to be against other people when actually we just have to be lovingly offering different information and let that information speak for itself. Uh, and for me, I feel like the, the role that we play in our, in our community in sharing about nutrition is, yeah, it's a re-education, but it's also a space of offering hope and possibility for people who need it most. So, um, so I think, you know, if there's anything to take away from this discussion, the biggest barrier that we may have is our own emotions and anger <laughs> at the situations that, that any of us are in. Um, and for me, you know, not having a cancer diagnosis, but having endometriosis and now not living with that condition anymore, thanks to my food choices, you know, I know that um, what, I, what I do is stronger um, than what others uh, may have control over from, from my own life. So um, this is a big deal. And I think the, the toughest piece of all this that has been brought up, and, and a few of you have mentioned it in the chat box, is is these access issues. Yes, there are some of us who do have the privilege to be able to overcome the, the systems that are disempowering us. Um, what do we do for others who don't have that? How can we be their vanguards? How can we bring this forward in a different way? Um, I'd love to hear others, those of you who have worked on some of those access issues and have found certain solutions that have worked. Yeah, maybe it's because of philanthropic dollars that it worked or it's because of some corporate relationship that worked, like how have you seen change happen? I can share a little bit about what we're doing locally too. Yeah, I think a lot of it just changed at grassroots where there are a lot of organizations that deal with cancer in, in Maine, not just with nutrition, that, that have come about because a family member has seen a, a service or resource that wasn't available to you know, their family member and they started know their own small organization to do something about it you know so you know and i think mm -hmm. there's the organization we start uh, that that i work for was started because a woman was diagnosed with breast cancer in 1996 and there were no resources around so she started a support group and then she created a foundation and then when she passed away her family kept the foundation going on and then they you know it kept growing so i think that's how, in, in, I think, in this area, you know, you know, people see a need. I mean, Lance Armstrong saw a need, and he, you know, you do something about it, and it does start at the grassroots level, and it, it, it's a long, it'll be a long process, but that's, um, it's a, a lot that happens here. I saw a note um, in the chat from Matthew Dexter. Um, Matthew, if you're still here, I would love for you to, to share a little bit. You were talking about your interested in perspective of sustainable nutrition assistance. Um, can you share um, a little bit? Hi, everyone. Can you can you hear me by any chance? Yes. Okay, my, my connection is relatively poor. I apologize. Um, uh, also with uh, Michael Riesman, who's spoken a couple times, I'm with the Christine B. Foundation based uh, just down the road from Michael's organization up in Maine. And one uh, service that really came about in the last 18 months was our nutrition assistance program offering kind of medically tailored grocery packages. So not prepared meals, but customizable grocery packages that have fresh produce, different types of grains different types of uh, protein, and then having pickup sites at oncology clinics, as well as home delivery. But one of the big challenges that we've faced, which I'd be really curious if anyone had any insight on, was balancing calorie intake with nutrition intake, because rural America, specifically where we're located in Maine, um, income levels are low, uh, uninsured rates are high. People have to travel 100 plus miles to their closest cancer treatment site. And um, it's, it's the older population that have kind of developed their own diet and, and way of consuming calories over many, many years of living. So it's hard to 
change behavior at that point and balance just making sure that food insecure families get access to calories versus now they're a patient receiving cancer treatment to try and change behavior in a sustainable way. So that's something we've been struggling with and also affording as a community-based organization, affording the freshest of produce and uh, whole grains and, and the lean proteins and all the things we're talking about, making sure it's accessible for, for us organizations, making this change is, is hard. Um, so I'd be open to any thoughts and ideas about that. Yeah, I think what you're bringing up, and you know, in New York, we're connected to everything, but there's all these like local food economies that are starting to flourish, where you've got people growing their own food in, you know, central Brooklyn, or people growing, creating a community garden in in the Heights, and and I feel like that mentality can also return to places outside of an urban area where you create a local um, food system that nourishes you and that I think will take the efforts of multiple partners coming together from different organizations and saying this is important this is going to help all of our communities in different ways whether you're fighting cancer over here or you're working on you know building healthy kids over there it, th there's something that um, brings people together in the process of growing food together um, that's not going to solve the whole you know the whole region's issues but the more that that mentality comes into play I think it's helpful are there others here who have sort of a, a food growing approach Kim you have your hand up um, food growing approach yes but I just wanted to add um, my name is Kim I'm one of the newer um, staff at for the Live Strong Foundation but formerly um, I ran the Livestrong program for the YMCA of Austin Association. And one of the things that I found that was so impactful um, and so positive, and, it, and I would just wanted to share, because I feel like there's a lot of um, professionals here, you know, uh, you know, uh, connections with institutes and stuff like that. During the 12 week uh, Livestrong at the Y program, I always brought in a speaker um, a registered dietitian, if I could find one, we a, we happen to have a connection to a local chef who was former former pastry chef turned um, plant based through some health concerns of herself, and she would have a one hour session where she would cook food from raw to serving and and get to share. And I know during COVID we 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 can't be doing this you know but for the future it was so impactful just to be able to show the difference um different types of um plant-based milks i think there was a lot of um i think there's a lot of interest or or maybe even confusion you know i've always wanted to try coconut milk but i'm i, I never felt brave enough to buy it or um i'd always wondered what quinoa is i just thought it was bird seeds and it's phenomenal you know like things like that. Um, and I, you know, I, if I ever had trouble finding someone, um, you know, a, a registered dietitian, or sometimes I'd have trouble finding, you know, uh, tracking down a, a, a chef, I would host it myself. It was, it wasn't anything spectacular or anything like that, you know, just to be able to show those examples of making a healthier choice, you know, like the canola oil versus coconut oil, um, I, I think a lot of people, cancer survivors, especially the ones that are very much into their routine and ways are, are maybe even interested, but don't know how to make that first step, don't know how to make the adjustment, or are concerned about, well, it says you want you cook it the same way as rice, those types of things. Um, so I'd, you know, I'd always wanted to share that. It, it, you, um, I think it could be in any type of professional um, cancer supportive setting, um, you know, and you, you just reach out to, I would reach out to the local university, um, the professors there, the registered dietitians, um, grad students, uh, local, um, uh, local high-end uh, restaurants that had the healthier eating choices, those types of things. It, it didn't really take much. And three, speakers or three sessions a year made a huge difference in, in making that positive impact and making those positive changes. 
um, for sure. Absolutely. I love that you said that, Kim, because that's what it's all about. If we can change the narrative by even having this as a piece of the discussion, and if we keep it alive and we give it regularity within our different organizational settings, um, that that can start to have people turn their heads and say, oh, I, I should think about that. Mm -hmm. That's great. Uh, Pamela. Sorry, I was having an issue. Um, thank you all for having this. And it's so great to hear we provide families um, and patients. I work with pediatric cancer patients uh, in the Texas area. And so um, something we do that Kim and made me think of, uh, we provide food in the clinic kitchens. Uh, so we fully stock their uh, kitchens every week. And we've started incorporating some healthier items um, that the families would maybe not have access to and just introducing those to the kids in a really positive way. Um, and something that has just been so successful are those like little veggie packs um, with the dip, you know, and so a little bit of indulgence with, you know, a ranch dip or a peanut butter or something like that, but they're getting their apples and carrots and, um, you know, different vegetables uh, and stuff like that. We've brought in coconut water um, and what the dietitians at the clinic have said is just parents are amazed that their kids are enjoying these new foods and you know the feedback has just been thank you um, for you know having giving us the opportunity to even try these um, and everything's free of cost uh, and so it's been really positive feedback of just trying to incorporate and um, introduce these foods and then we've y'all talked a little bit about partnerships and collaborating and we uh, have a foundation that also uh, provides weekly organic uh, fruit and vegetable deliveries um, to the hospitals uh, for our pediatric oncology hematology patients. Um, and that is something that the CEO of this company uh, is a cancer survivor himself, and he's very passionate about nutrition. Uh, and so he has uh, come alongside and helped us. Uh, but really, you know, that, it, when you talk about access, we're trying to address that barrier, I guess, as much as possible. So, thank That's you all. Fun. I've learned so much from being here. Um, That's great. Liana, if you don't mind me just piggybacking on what everyone is saying, this is absolutely wonderful. I think that it is very important that networking and partnerships continue to grow. But something that I want to add from our experience is advocacy to local elected officials as well. Um, whether that's having them support other partners, um, bringing fresh produce into the neighborhood, farmers markets, whatever the case may be, SNAP benefits being used at the farmers markets, but also discretionary dollars. I know that we apply every year for as much as we can. And a lot of the times they're interested in these innovative programs. Um, so that's another way that you could potentially supplement what you're offering your members or clients. Absolutely, yeah. Anyone else? I know we're going to wrap up pretty soon, but I want to make space for maybe one or two more people. Great. I'm curious, as, you know, what are your takeaways? What are the things that really stood out for you in this discussion? Something you think you're going to do next related to nutrition and addressing the barriers that, that we've talked about? Well, I'll go because I'll tell you what's going to happen next <laughs> on my end. Um, so not only have I taken a lot of notes, I have learned so much from all of you. Um, it's not just about the, the content of the food that's going in people's bodies. It's about how to get it there and what those barriers are. And if we can just break some of those down, I think that then we have this opportunity to really start informing. So my highlights are things like um, education of nurse practitioners, family, full family education, which I thought was really great to educate the entire family. Nan, I think you said that, that the whole family, not just the patient. Oh, of course, right? Um, and then I think about also collaboration, which you, which you spoke of, because Pamela, I need to make sure that you're, con <laughs> that you're connected with Nan. And then also Elizabeth, um, I think you need to know Matthew and, and 
um, Michael, because I think you're, you, you're, you don't know this, but you're in proximity, right? And I'm, I, I'm a huge believer in collaboration here, but I think there's some great stuff. Shu, you shared some of the things that you're going to do about your program, and I hope you share the success of that. Um, also, local food systems, which I thought was really fascinating. I love this idea of local food systems, especially solving for rural, right? Um, I'm in Austin, and if you think I'm not in a rural community, you're wrong, because you drive 10 minutes and um, you can't get cell service, and um, Sitco is your grocery store. So um, local food systems is really interesting, and then in conjunction um, with our Live Strong at the Y program, Kim brought this up, and we're working now on, on um, building back up that Live Strong at the Y program now that COVID is ending. Yay, I hope. Um, and, um, and perhaps there's a way to integrate whatever this nutrition thing looks like into our, our exercise um, for cancer survivor um, program. And so it's an integrated well-being approach instead of just, um, just that physical well-being as, as an exercise curriculum, but it's, it's a nutritional curriculum as well. So those are my takeaways from this incredible conversation. And then I also want to let you know that you're stuck with me now. So I know who you are. Um, and what that means is that our next steps will be that you'll be hearing from me again when we dive into building solutions for these things that we talked about today. So no more barrier talk. It's all about real solution talk. So thank you all for coming. I will let, um, Leanna, I will let you close it out, but um, I just can't thank you enough for your, um, for everybody sharing. Fantastic. Yes. Uh, did some of you want to share some, something, Robert? Was that a hand up or? A... No? Okay. <laughs> great. No, it was great to meet all of you. Thank you so much. Um, I know, uh, Dr. Bennett, you're going to continue to promote healthy eating and grow your own vegetables and support groups. Fantastic. Uh, if there are other next steps that you're interested in sharing, feel free to put them in the chat box or unmute for a moment. Um, fantastic. I think, you know, when Aisha and I were talking about where we could take this conversation today, just thinking about all the different layers of barriers can really get, get you like <laughs> um, a little down, but I feel so inspired by all that we are accomplishing in our own ways. And, and as Suzanne was saying, the connecting the dots is, is crucial to all of this. Uh, that's something that really uh, defines how I think about my work as a, the director of a network. I think about work through a network lens and um, trying to make sure that whatever I do and the people who, who you know, are touched by our work are properly connected with the resources and other relationships that they need. I think that's where so much of our, our benefit in addressing nutrition is going to come from by, by being a bridge to the resources that are valuable for people and, um, and creating those sort of economies through our relationships.